It is a pleasure to welcome Roberto Antonelli to the University of Rochester and to this celebration of our Italian Baroque organ. He speaks to us this afternoon on the topic of Italian influences in the music of the Jesuit reductions. Please welcome Roberto Antonello. Good afternoon. Uh, the Jesuit reductions in South America developed between 1609 and 1768 along the immense territories where nowadays Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia exist. During that one and a half century, an incredible activity related also to the arts developed through the inputs coming from Europe and the works of the Jesuit missionaries. The music were considered an educational tool attracting the natives to the villages and making them more malleable to accept the new rules imposed by the social life in the reductions. The name of Domenico Zipoli is the main Italian name connected with music in the reductions. Due to the fact that a huge amount of music circulating in the villages was by unknown composers, and knowing the fact that, that many artists of various fields moved there from different European countries to South America, I wonder. Oh, sorry. Who were the most active uh, musicians in the reduction? The second question, what Italian artists in a wider sense moved there? What were the Italian musicians active there? And what was the Italian influence in the music? And was there any legacy that is also important to see if there was a legacy in it? So the first question is, who were the most active musicians in the reductions? Through the chronicles of the times and the reports of emissaries coming from Europe, we discover a number of musicians who were active during those 150 years. Rodrigo de Melgarello from Spain, Jean Besso from Belgium, Louis Berger from France, Anton Sepp from Caldaro. Uh, at the time it was in South Tyrol, Austria, but nowadays it's Italy. Uh, Domenico Zipoli from Prato and Marty Schmidt uh, from Switzerland. The extraordinary music result the Jesuit achieved in the reductions arrived to Europe during the 18th century. And Pope Benedict XIV uh, wrote about this in his encyclical dated 19 February 1749. He wrote, the use of harmonica or figurative chant has spread all over the world and even in the missions or in Paraguay it is realized because those believers in America have an innate gift both for vocal and instrumental music. Uh, they have been so successful, the missionaries, uh, to, were so, so successful to learn, uh, to, um, to teach music, that nowadays almost no difference exists between the masses and vespers sung in our churches in Europe and those performed in the reductions. So it's a witness of the high level that was reached at the time. Just to have an idea of what was the life in the missions, in the heart of South America, the Jesuits were able to found uh, over 30 villages, mixing civic and religious life. Some priests in each village led the social organization with the help of the native Indians, gathering a total of 150,000 inhabitants, including churches, building churches and houses, cultivating the fields, and breeding domestic animals like uh, cows, chickens, hens, rabbits, donkeys, up to 250,000 heads of cattle. So it was really a, a huge work that was done at the time. Uh, they introduced also a sort of a welfare system protecting widows and uh, orphans and granting the necessary for uh, everyday life to the weakest part of the society. In this sort of Catholic communist society, education had a central role. Compared with the Dominicans using Spanish language or Franciscans at a later time that were adopting local languages like, uh, like the Chiquita and the Guarani, the Jesuits stressed the, the importance of using the Latin in sacred music while approaching the natives through their own languages who were learned beforehand. The use of the Latin language meant not only the use of the universal language of the Roman Church, but also teaching a language 
uh, opening the world of knowledge since all the main books were written in Latin, providing the natives with a chance to approach a European culture and, as a consequence of it, uh, to create a condition for a democratic evolution of the society. Music itself was a tool of civilization. Many people were able to play musical instruments. We have a lot of description of it. The inventor is done at the Jesuits' expulsion in 1768 under the kingdom that Spanish king Charles III described a lot of European instruments formerly imported from Europe and later locally built according to the models or with the tiny changes. So for example, violins, uh, a remark is to the body of the instrument that is larger in this point. It has particular resonance in the uh, low uh, tones. Or cellos, a double bass and tromba marina. Tromba marina is a sort of a monochord that is played that is a string instrument. I don't know the English for, for it. It's, uh, in Italian, it's called in this way. Uh, flutes, uh, trumpets, like here. Uh, bassoons. Dulcians. Harps. Harpsichord and organs. As well as many scores belonging to the, the missions. About two-thirds of the villages had two organs. The main one being installed in the church, the second one being a positive to be played in processions. Very few instruments survived the expansions. Spanish and Portuguese army destroyed and sacked the villages. And so it's, uh, uh, these were part of, uh, of the instruments that were found and moved to the museum. So the second question is, uh, uh, what, was, uh, what Italian artists, in a wider sense, moved there? So many Italians moved from their birthplace to South America for different reasons. The utopia of a social uh, of a society without evil or an earth paradise attracted many people, not only Jesuit priests. I will not show a complete list of names since, in fact, the movement from Italy to South America was rather the first big emigration than an individual trip. Yet some artists and their activities are connected with music. I am mainly referring to the architects, uh, since the, their buildings uh, were conditioning the performance music as it was in Europe. And the relation between music and the place, a space where it is or it was performed, is very strict. Among the founders of the redaction, we mention Giuseppe Cataldini. It was a Jesuit uh, born in Fabriano, near Ancona active in Sant'Ignazio Mini, and Simone Maceta, uh, born in Castilenti and active in uh, Nostra Signora de Loreto. Uh, it seems that they also introduced uh, some musical instruments in the missions, being the originators of the uh, reductions. Later on, many missionaries were experiencing different arts, mainly uh, architecture. So we mention Giuseppe Bresanelli, who built uh, uh, he was a, a Lombard architect and painter, great admirer of uh, Bernini, who built uh, St. Peter's in Rome and the Trevi Fountain. Uh, Bressanelli built the main church in Sant'Ignazio Mini with uh, Angelo Camillo Petragrassa, born in Pavia. He came uh, as parish priest in uh, 1691. The church was finished in 1724 and has a size of 70 per 28 meters. So it was really a huge church. Uh, Bressanelli was also named uh, the second Michelangelo and brought the Roman art in the reductions. He was buried inside this church. Giovanni Andrea Bianchi, born in Campione d'Italia near Como, was an architect who worked with Bressanelli and Preta Grassa, being active in Cordoba uh, and in the Estancia in uh, di Santa Catalina where it is uh, buried uh, Domenico Zipoli. Giovanni Battista Primoli was born in Milano and was inspired by the Roman Baroque art. He was art active in Buenos Aires, Cordoba, uh, St. Michael and Trinity. These are the names of the villages. In 1720, he went to Cordoba taking part in the building of the Collegio Massimo and the, uni at the, and the university, as well as lifting the final construction 
of the majestic Baroque Cathedral, Andrea Bianchi was charged to finish it. Other works of his were the churches of the villages of San Miguel, Trinidad, and Concepcion in the Guayran missions. Pier Paolo Danesi from Baluco was a, a, an architect and expert in mechanical clocks construction. Other noteworthy figure, figures are Agostino Salombrini, who went at the beginning of the uh, um, 17th century. He was a male nurse, and in 1630, for the first time, he used the quinin to treat the malaria. Padre Bonaventura Suarez was the first astronomer in the missions. In spite of the distance, he worked in cooperation with other astronomers in Vienna and in St. Petersburg, leading important studies on the lunar movements. He fused the first bronze bell in the reduction and is remembered as the inventor of chocolate with peanuts. <laughs> Antonio Mazzoni, born in Iglesias in Sardinia, he was a linguist and then became a rector of the Collegio Massimo in, um, in Cordoba and procurator in Roma of the Provinces uh, of Paraguay. So, uh, as you see, art, study, and research played an important role in those communities. What were the Italian musicians active there, and what was the Italian influence in the music? So we have a direct influence of the Italians and indirect. Direct influences in music are due to the musicians who moved to South America. In fact, any musician or composer was bringing not only his own instrument or music, but also his musical background made of several aspects, as well as of the teachings received in youth or the contacts with the contemporaries. There are at least two outstanding names <coughs> among, the, uh, among the ones I mentioned at the beginning, Anton Sepp and Domenico Zipoli. But before their arrival, we must mention Pietro Commentale, who was born in Naples, and this is very important. He taught music in Cordoba and Buenos Aires in the missions of Iapeyu and San Ignacio Mini, from 1610 to 1640. He introduced the music in Rio de la Plata, and he was asked in 1628 to present an ensemble of Indian musicians in the harbor of Buenos Aires to welcome a contingent of European missionaries. Anton Sepp was born in Caldaro, not far from Bolzano, so nowadays it is in, uh, in Italy. He studied in Innsbruck and in Vienna, and he was a singer in the court choir. It is uh, written that he was able to play up to 20 different instruments. And this is very important because his name is uh, connected with the uh, import of any sort of European instrument in South America, as well for teaching. We have uh, witnesses that he was able to uh, train at least uh, 20 to 30 uh, musicians per year in different instruments. So it means that in one year, more or less, one, maximum two years, he was able to teach uh, how to play violin, how to play harpsichord or organ or a trumpet or a flute. So it's uh, incredible from this point of view. He's also considered to be the builder of the first organ with the pedal board produced in the reductions and to be delivered in the YAPU missions. We have here some pictures, some details of the organ that I collected. For sure, he imported in South America all kinds of instruments, and he was considered also a pioneer in iron fusion and in con cotton manufacture, that is, till nowadays, the most exported product of uh, Paraguay. He also, his name is also related to the Paraguayan heart. Um, so the mission of San, uh, San John the Baptist was well renowned for the uh, musical instruments. They were built and they were delivered through emissaries to other villages since every village had orchestras and choirs where the Indians played and sang. Music scores were sent in the same way all over South America, departing mainly from Cordoba, now Argentina, that was the main city after sailing the Atlantic Ocean to Buenos Aires. Zippoli music, music has the same chance. Domenico Zippoli was born in Prato, near Florence. He studied, as I said this morning, in, uh, in Prato, then in Florence, then moved to Naples to study with Alessandro Scarlatti, then with, uh, Luigi, uh, with Felice Lavinio Vannucci in Bologna, and finally 
Um, finally, he, um, with the help of Cosimo III, Cosimo III, he studied in Rome with Bernardo Pasquini in uh, 1710. From 10 to 14, he presented in Rome the Vespri and Mess for the Fest of San uh, Charles in San Carlo e Catinari Church. So, Vespers and Mess. There is another link with the concert of tonight. Uh, the Oratory Sant'Antonio di Padova in Santa Maria della Vallicella and uh, another Oratorio Santa Caterina Vergine e, Margine, e, e, Vergine e Martire in the Church of San Girolamo della Carità. In 1715 he was organist in Chiesa del Gesù in Rome and in 16 he published uh, Sonate di Intavolatura per Organo e Cimbalo issued in Rome and then in London. The contact with Pasquini was very important for Zipoli. Large use of ornaments, irregular melodic patterns, chromatism, and a certain freedom in rhythm were retained. Almost all Zippoli's pieces had lost. We remember his cantata, Delle offese a vendicarmi, for soprano and continuo, now in Berlin Deutsche Bibliothek, and a sonata for violin and continuo in Dresden Landes Bibliothek, both date probably on 1717. In uh, 1716, he entered into the Jesuit order, went to Sevilla through Genova, and then moved to Rio de la Plata. In those years, the historian Pedro Lozano, who later left many references to Zipoli's life, and the architects Primoli and Bianchi traveled more or less together in the same direction. And even if only set in Cordoba for his weak health, Zipoli was very popular at the time. You see, uh, uh, it is important in this ordinarium. You see, uh, Veatus Vir is a modification of the Spanish pronunciation by Zipoli. So it was very important if it was mentioned in, in this uh, ordinarium for the Mass. Many uh, manuscripts uh, were discovered, and in particular, the American musicologist Robert Stevenson in 58, 1958 amazed the music world by discovering in the uh, archives of Sucre in Bolivia a manuscript of a mass with the title Mass by Zippoli for four voices copied in Potosi in 1784. So it was already copied in 1784. Uh, many other pieces like Beatus Vir and Confitebor are mentioned in the um, uh, inventories at the expulsion of the Jesuits. Other scores appeared in Mosos, uh, brought by the Indians themselves, uh, who preserved uh, them for, uh, for years. Um, how you can easily imagine, these copies are full of mistakes in the text and in music as well. Uh, but through them, this repertory, otherwise lost forever, has been saved. The archive in Concepcion in Sant'Ignacio de Mossos and the Guardian Musician in Santa Ana Redaction passed us this word heritage disappearing at the end of the 90s. Most of the scores give a clear reference to the performance concerning instruments, continual parts of free voice, choir with solos, tempo, dynamics, and articulation. Zippo's music is performed until nowadays in the main ceremonies, uh, leaving apart uh, all problems connected with the attribution of this of music, we can remark the following peculiar features. The general absence of the bass voice. It is said that uh, Indians were not able to play, to sing in the bass uh, voice. And the pieces with the bass voices were composed when somebody arrived from Europe. Alternating of solace uh, and chorus parts. General indication of strings, uh, Violins contrasting with a large number of instruments listed in inventories are suggesting the possibility to arrange the parts more freely. Both complete and separate parts are present and may be found. Generally, dynamic is indicated in the separate parts. The continuum is sometimes written with a few and simple chords. Second, violin sometimes overtaking the first one, then jumping one octave lower in the alto region. The music can be played with strings mainly in first position, so they can be easy to be learned. And the music and the winter process are similar to endless music, being reused in several pieces in excerpts. Zippoli's masses have neither Benedictus nor Annus Deis, generally, reminding us some Misa Brevis composed in Europe. Uh, we have the example of a Misa Sant'Ignacio that is complete, but uh, some other misses are incomplete with only um, Kyrie and Gloria. Uh, 
Female voices were uh, performed by children and they achieved the result is a high solemn atmosphere with a very simple means. As far as concern the organ method, Principia Several Elementa Bene Pulsandum Organum et Cimbalum, I already mentioned it was uh, on the way perhaps already in Rome. We have these witnesses that uh, he was uh, working on it. He moved in South America and then finally, um, uh, finally he prepared a, a collection of pieces that we found with uh, this same uh, title. Um, a copy of this book has been brought from Cordoba, now Argentina, to Chiquitos in Bolivia. Uh, by Father Esteban Palozzi, who also traveled with, uh, with Zipoli. Uh, these, pace, uh, these pieces are indistinctly for organ or um, harpsichord. Uh, there are also included some pieces by Juan Messner and Martin Schmidt, who, were copied, uh, who copied this collection of pieces in a later time and added some more uh, pieces of them. Among the minor Italian musicians, we mentioned also Gaetano Cattaneo, arriving from Modena in 1729 and died in 1733. Besides this, we have an indirect influence of many Italians. Uh, we have a, a strong influence of the Neapolitan uh, composers um, like uh, Scarlatti, Durante, Feo and Percolesi, who reached the South America through uh, they, uh, their influence in Rome and through Spain. So it was a double way to reach South America, as well as uh, uh, Corelli that was adapted to be played uh, on a keyboard instrument by Zipoli himself. You find uh, here inside uh, several uh, excerpts from Opus 5 by Corelli. It's an opus for violin and continuum. So a final question, was there any legacy about it? We wonder what kind of a legacy was handed over after the direct presence of the Italian composers as well as the indirect influence we just mentioned. Were the Italian Jesuits able to create a school allowing autonomous development? From chronicles of the time, we know that the School of Music in Santa Rosa Missions became famous uh, thanks to the works of Antonio Guayaki, who was a pupil of, of Zipoli. So Zipoli was able to develop a local school. Julian Atirau, in 18th century, studied in a Jesuit redaction, and he is known because he wrote a rondo and minuet for violin, for two violins, printed in the missions. In fact, this is a Rembrandt canon, and you will see. It was, uh, this, piece is, uh, this piece was considered highly ingenious at that time, because two players, one in front of the other, performed the piece and when they arrived at the end, they turn the score and can play the same melody uh, in reverse order and the music is affecting all the same. So it's uh, really ingenious. And later on, we have uh, the name of Cristobal Piriobi, who was born in 60, 1765 and died at age 30, who went to Buenos Aires, who was an Indian, went to Buenos Aires and was considered a great expert, a great expert in Italian music, in particular on Boccherini and Clementi. He's, uh, he was a, a harpsichordist, well known, but he taught also singing, violin, to play violin and guitar. He was also able to build several instruments. And so uh, we see that in his library, uh, we found those scores by Haydn, Boccherini, Clementi, Stamets, Pleyel, so, uh, with a lot of a variety in instrumentation, demonstrating a high music uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, he died in Buenos Aires, and the inventories we find two keyboard instruments with a cedar wood, one finished and the other almost finished. One with a hammer and the other with the plectrums. The one strung spinet, always in cedar wood, three guitar just finished. So he was able a great variety of instruments. If you had the chance to reach those lands and to meet people in the, in the villages, the Jesuit music, joined with the Italian influence, is still present today. Some pieces are still sung and or played by the natives after almost three centuries, in particular some of Zippoli's vocal pieces. 
The leg legacy has become a cultural heritage, something unifying those people and belonging to their collective past, a cultural identity to be preserved and to make a living of. Thank you. South America, whether they brought chant books with them for the mass and for the offices, and whether that would have been the, what, the Medellin edition from the early 17th century? What, what, do we have any records of them bringing the, the kind of chant books that would have been needed? For the, uh, for the Jesuits, uh, uh, culture was a very important aspect, uh, and um, so they, they tried to move the best that was in Europe to create this uh, sort of a, a real utopia, if we may say this, uh, or Seymour. Or Seymour. Uh, it's uh, because uh, they tried to, to build a, um, a state without evil. So the best of the European culture was moved there. Uh, the best of the technology, we have, uh, for example, um, even before the Jesuits, the printing in South America was very important. The first book was printed in the missions and then was brought to Buenos Aires. They installed a, a printing house in, the, um, in 1582 in a mission. So uh, it, it was something very important. And for the Jesuit, uh, the, um, the culture to access knowledge was a really powerful mean for everybody. I, I think it's uh, something that they must really be uh, stressed um, because uh, the main uh, books of the, of the time were written in Latin. If you were able to understand Latin language, you have access to the whole knowledge of the time. If you don't know Latin, you cannot uh, assess it. And Latin came in use through a large use in, in, uh, in the liturgy, of course, and then it was, uh, uh, it was taught in the school. Uh, so it, it, it was a tool, as, uh, as it was a music, for example. And so they tried to, to bring the, the best, uh, trying also to adapt to the local uh, uh, systems, but uh, it was something really uh, astonishing because it involved uh, several aspects um, of a civil, uh, civil life. So you mentioned the copy of the Zippy Mass from 1784, I think. Um, so I was wondering, can you say any more about patterns of transmission for Zippy's music, for, for the choral music or the organ music, and whether this was really staying very locally within a particular community or passing around with different mission communities? Yeah, uh, this is very interesting because uh, uh, Zippoli moved to South America. He arrived uh, first in Buenos Aires, then moved uh, to Cordoba. And uh, it, it was every, uh, everywhere written that uh, he died in Cordoba. In reality, he was not dying in, in Cordoba, but in the Estancia of Santa Catalina, that is near Cordoba. He never moved from there because he, was, he has a weak health and he was not able to travel from one mission to the other. And so uh, his music was uh, copied several times at this time, and through emissaries was reaching different uh, villages and spread all over the villages. Otherwise, there would be no reason to mention uh, Beatus Vir by Zipolina uh, or Domisse, or uh, to quote in the inventories at the expansion of the Jesuit to say, oh, we have uh, this and this and this instrument, we have this and this and this uh, statue, we have this and this and this uh, painting, as we have this and this and these pieces by Zippoli. So Zippoli was always mentioned. He was so famous that maybe also somebody else added Zippoli's name to scores that are not by Zippoli. And the problem is that when uh, there was the expansion of the Jesuits, there were also the destruction of these uh, communities 
so that the natives uh, tried to, uh, to save what was possible to save at the time. If you saw the film, uh, uh, the movie, uh, The Mission by Robert Zoffé with the Robert De Niro as a main actor, you can have an idea of what happened at the, at the time. Of course, it is a movie, but the, the historical background is true. So there was a lot of destruction, and the, and the um, natives tried really to save what they could. Je the Jesuit uh, moved something from the missions to other places, uh, like in Cordoba or like uh, in the main cities, uh, in uh, Chiquito, and so on. So part uh, was saved in that way. Part uh, remained uh, hidden in the, between the ruins. The architect uh, Hans Roth in the 80s was uh, uh, charged by the UNESCO to class the monuments there. And he reached a mission and he found a wooden box. And when, you, when he opened it, he found a lot of scores classified as TP. It's a toilet paper. It was a box full of scores. So many music was uh, lost forever. And um, another, another part of the, of the repertory is, uh, was saved uh, through these uh, guardian angels so that were some Indians that were able to collect everything in very fast time and to bring it in the forest so that it, it could not be uh, reached by the Spanish and the Portuguese. And they saved, uh, in this way, uh, ornaments, uh, furniture of the churches, uh, sculptures, instruments, music also. And you know, it's impossible to, to keep a music so long in a forest with such a huge humidity. And so for this reason, it, it was copied several times. Uh, pieces were added and modified. Uh, there are a lot of mistakes. Uh, some of music are now spread and they are not uh, collected altogether. So there are different problems also at the, of attribution in this, uh, in this sense. Is there time for one more question? Um, my, my question is, more related to Zeebuli's personal trajectory. I was, I was reading Stevenson the other day, and he mentions that during the early Bourbon period, uh, Madrid had become essentially an Italian fiefdom, that the music of Italian composers and performers had become the rage in the courts. And it would seem to me that Zeebuli could have made quite a name for himself and enriches for himself by simply making that trip from from Italy to, to Spain and remaining there as a very successful uh, musician composer. What do we know anything about his life that would lead us to understand his motivation to leave to leave all that for life in the reductions of uh, these Guarani territories? Uh, yes, in the reduction they tried always to uh, to build these uh, communities, uh, these villages uh, out of the main center because these. Uh, uh, ut utopical uh, society without evil uh, should have no contact with the, uh, with the main courts uh, and with the main cities. So there is a distinction uh, from the court music and the music in the villages. In the villages, uh, since uh, there, there, there was no evil, all the music could, in a certain sense, be sacred, not only during the rite, but uh, in everyday life, uh, it was uh, assessed by a larger part of the people. We have witnesses that we have a choir and orchestras in every village with uh, ranging up to 30 to 40 musicians in uh, each uh, village. We cannot forget that at the time, uh, through Spain, as I said, but also through Portugal, the Portuguese court, um, the Portuguese king was looking to Italy as the top. You must remember that in uh, 1717, uh, so in the same year Zipoli went to South America, um, the king of, um, of Portugal started uh, to build the Palacio Nacional de Mafra. It's the huge palace uh, with an enormous library, and it is everything is built in Italian style. So the, uh, also the king of Portugal has a reference in Rome, to the Italian marble, Italian sculptures. And so um, in the court, uh, the music arrived from Italy through that way, not through Zipoli. Zipoli was uh, mainly involved in South America in the range of the uh, second music. There is another yeah, the short question, please. Um, his two oratorios, San Antonio de Padua and Santa Catarina, 
Is there anything musical left from them, or we just have fragments, or nothing is left, just the titles of curatorios? Is there any actual music left? Uh, we have witnesses that they were performed, uh, but we don't have the music. So, um, a lot of music of Zippoli is lost, except those uh, two pieces. The Leofesa Vendicarmi is a cantata that is in uh, Dresden, and the other piece is a sonata for violin. And, um, and continue. And of course, the Sonate di Intavolatura, we have the manuscript in Rome, and we found recently another manuscript in uh, Macerata that contains the same pieces plus nine that were not included in the printed version and are now separately uh, printed by Armeni. They had nothing to the, to the works of Zippoli, but it's important to know that uh, there are also these nine more pieces for keyboard instruments. Well, let's thank Roberto for his very informative papers.